Attention, attention, attention. Okay. Um, let's see. So I, I think it's. Uh, I think I will make a few comments about the about the exam. Um, let's see if it's the best way. They they are typical in their results for the semesters that I have been teaching this. Um, I, I do think there's lots of room for improvement. Uh, obviously, a lot of it has to do that I only get you two and a half hours a week, and uh, it, 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 it's hard to get all the information across in, in two and a half hours. Uh, that being said, there's eight or nine students that are able to get 70 to 80% of the problems correct. So um, there is, you know, it is, it is not, in, in, in my view, an impossible test. Um, I can tell you, well, certainly I think that the first three were, were ones that I had told you before. You know, there's, there's going to be kinematics problems. Uh, there's going to be calculate momentum or calculate energy or calculate velocity. So um, I, I think that, uh, that those were probably very, very much expected. Uh, number four is actually a problem that was in your chapter 40 homework. And it was taken, um, I don't have the, the number, I do. it's, it's P055, so I forget how they do it. It's, uh, it's chapter 40, zero, zero five five, I think, is the way the book is. Yeah. So this is problem identifier 55. And basically, what it does is to say there's a stream of neutrons going through a, oh, you don't need the glasses until I turn on the light. I mean, it makes everything more exciting. It does, okay, well then I enjoy them. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, go back and review this one. This is the same as problem, uh, problem four. Now, I put all of the solutions on my door. You can come visit them and take pictures after class, write them down. Uh, the solutions to the problems are on, on my door and you can work them out. But um, I, I, I know there's a general tendency for people to say, well, all the, the tests are not like the homework. Um, I can have that discussion with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I, I believe that in 80% of the problems, I can find a homework problem that uses the exact same equation. And, uh, or it's, it's a, something that I've said ahead of time, namely that we're gonna have constant scattering problems. We're gonna have relativistic problems. There were examples of those on Blackboard. So I've tried to give as many hints as I could. Uh, that being said, uh, there's no substitute for spending more time on the physics course. And, um, you know, one way to do that is to do extra problems uh, in the back where the odd number problems have solutions in the book, and uh, you can you can try that. Many of you have Chegg anyway, so you can find problems that are similar. Or, you know, more importantly, step just study the ones that I have already given you and say, what is this problem trying to tell me? And too often the idea is, what parameters am I given? Which formula has the missing parameter? Which way do I plug it in? And I specifically try to avoid questions that allow you to solve it that way. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is, do you understand the meaning of the equations? Uh, the equations are always going to be given to you in my class. Uh, what I'm looking for is, do you understand what the equations are saying in terms of an example of physics? Okay. Um, now, I know the material is hard. I, I, I get that entirely. I spend six hours a week on the course, and I don't even have to work the homework. Uh, but I do that not because I'm trying to learn the material right now. I'm doing that because I'm trying to find a way to uh, make connections between the concepts and to shorten your, your time, and also reach you at a level where I think you are, uh, you know, that, 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 that's understandable at your, at, at your level, uh, not at the level of a junior or senior. So um, anyway, that being said, um, you can expect similar problems on the exam. The exam is comprehensive. Go back and look at the solutions to this one and the solutions to the first exam problem. And, um, uh, you know, aside from studying concepts, I think 
there's no substitute for working problems. It's amazing how much you learn after you work the first 500 problems in physics. I mean, it's just amazing how much you learn when you've done 500 problems. So uh, there's no substitute for that. But try to find ones in the area that I emphasize because I, I think you probably can tell from the homework and the exam what are the areas that I emphasize. And that hopefully is by now going to help you the most going into the final, the final exam. Okay. Um, one thing I will, one problem I will work, uh, most people miss the one on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And um, that one was a little surprising to me because we get the derivation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle using a single state. And um, that one was one where we said that if a particle goes through the slit, then the coordinates, the y coordinate of the particle will be zero plus or minus d over two. Okay. So d over two, if I, if I detected a particle here, it had to go through the slit. If it went through the slit, I know where it was to within the accuracy of the width of the slit. Right? So what we also know is that once the particle goes through the slit, it diffracts like a, like a wave. It may go in this direction, it may go in this direction, it may go straight ahead. And this is where, in Einstein's words, God rolls the dice. God plays dice with the world. He basically, at this point, we do no longer know with precision that the momentum is going straight ahead. It can move off x. So this represents the uncertainty, delta p sub x, or p sub y, I'm sorry. Right? And the uncertainty in the position is d over 2. So the uncertainty in the momentum times the uncertainty in the position is, I'm sorry, this should be wrong, delta y greater than or equal to uh, h bar. Now, I purposely gave answers so that you, you, know, you weren't confused between h over 2 and h over 2 times a pi. So the answers were far enough apart that you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have to know that. But this equation was given to you. So, so basically, the idea is that, OK, well, I just, I just put this in. h bar is 200 uh, EV over C, which is the unit of momentum times position times nanometers. Okay. And if this is, if D is, is, is 0 0.5 nanometers, then the uncertainty in the, in the uh, position <coughs> of the particle is going to be plus or minus 0.25. So, um, this means that uh, the delta y, the delta p sub y, will be greater than or equal to 200 divided by uh, 0 0.25, which is 800 EV over C. Okay? And that's all I expect you to do. Okay? Um, and the idea is that the uncertainty principle comes about because the particle acts like a wave. Once it diffracts, I no longer know with any with, with great precision or with precision better than this number what the transverse momentum is after it goes through a slit because it acts like a wave. If it acted like a particle, then all of the particles would arrive on the slit between here and here. The intensity pattern would look like that, and they would all be within. They would produce a shadow on the, on the screen, and it would be only the width of the slit. This width will be equal to d. Right? That's what a particle would do. You're shaking your head. Oh, I was just, I was plugging in like values for h instead of just doing h over 2 pi is 200. Yeah, you could do that too. I mean, I mean, so, so h, uh, uh, yes, yes, you could do that too. Then you have that, I mean, you, you, you can start with h equals 1240 EV over C times nanometers, and then divide that by 6.28, and that's 197, but I call it 200, and that's 200, that becomes h bar, and that's EV over C nanometers. That's, the, that's how you get the thing. I mean, I, I, I basically, but I gave you both forms on your, on your uh, equation sheet. You, you could either start with H at 1240, or you could start with H bar at 200. Okay. And I did uh, also tell you, I, I realized that some of the homework problems use uh, uh, MKS, international units, uh, meter, kilogram, seconds. And I, I'm just, I'm never going to ask you a question in meter, kilogram, seconds. 
don't believe in it, the wrong units to use, you make a mistake just trying to calculate something with it, I, I it goes easier to do that. Um, uh, and anytime you see an M in the equation, multiply by C squared and divide by C squared. And usually you can actually do that in a way so you get everything, in, you know, your mass is in EV. Um, your mass times C squared is in, is in, is in my control. Okay, any other questions on this uh, before, before, before we go on? Um, so anyway, that's my, my best advice. Uh, I think this is, this is also a learning exercise. So, uh, you know, study, study, go, study these things. You know, just, just go over the exam. Uh, try to see what you did wrong, where your mistakes were, and, um, you know, uh, see, see that's, that's the best way to learn. You know, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's no fun to learn with a low test score. I understand that. But there is another test coming, and, you know, everyone can do better. Yeah. Really? Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay. Then we'll move on. Okay. So now what we should do is uh, uh, move further along on uh, on chapter forty-two, and we will I will review very briefly w where we left off last time. Um, so last time we uh, we were looking at the hydrogen atom and the equation, or let's look at the, at the, at the, at the physical environment of the, the, the problem the problem we were trying to solve. So we have a coordinate system that is centered on the proton, right? And we were looking at the electron uh, motion, or we could say electron wave function, or electron motion, or the electron wave equation, wave, this should be V, um, motion, um, I'll make this a little bit bigger, let me see if I can do a little bit better job, I'm write it. electron uh, motion, or electron wave function, Okay, um, and this is this is a little bit. This is what we had we were describing. So for uh, and this was for uh, for hydrogen. So we choose hydrogen because with hydrogen uh, we have a set case with a single proton in the center. It has a charge plus e. Okay, and uh, in my notation uh, e. I'm going to use E in the positive sense, where E is equal to the absolute value of E, which is equal to plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 <coughs> coulombs. So I have plus E for the proton. And then what we were doing is looking at, uh, when we looked at the Bohr, the Bohr model of the atom, then we looked at electrons that were moving around in their orbits. Um, trying to think whether I should use multicolor here or not. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll try that. Try to use multicolor so we can see things a little bit better. Um, so it looks something like uh, I might imagine a orbit that is going around the the nucleus. Um, by the way, we also said that the we could be dealing with larger number of protons. So let me generalize this and call this plus z, where z is the atomic number of the element. But there is only one electron, uh, and this is a z, only one electron in the orbit. And this electron is zipping around on an outer orbit that uh, has some momentum and velocity here, like this. And this is the conceptual picture that we have. Uh, it's hard not to think of electron in its motion as, as moving. Uh, so we use this analogy a lot, but in reality, we now have switched our understanding or our theory of what is going on in terms of the wave function. So the Bohr model was based on this very concept. The Bohr model said, 
Electrons have definite orbits. They go in circular orbits. Their angular momentum is quantized. Therefore, their energies were quantized. And the energies for the hydrogen atom agreed with the energy for, um, uh, that was observed. The energy predicted by Bohr for the, the energies of the electron were confirmed by the wavelengths observed from, from light. Um, speaking of wavelengths of light, so I realize that we've talked a lot about uh, light of different uh, substances producing different wavelengths. Uh, and because we are focusing on hydrogen for this part of the course, uh, obviously if we're going to solve a electron going around a nucleus, the simplest one to choose is hydrogen, right? Because there's only one electron and one proton. It's more complicated if we have an atom with a bunch of electrons and, and, and more protons. So we start with this one first. So uh, the, uh, the wavelengths that are observed are taken from a discharge tube. So what we have here is a, uh, a glass tube that is partially filled. And this is where your glasses come in. Um, which is partially filled, or it has a low pressure hydrogen in the tube, and a high voltage that uh, electrodes that emit electrons from one uh, one side, one end, and as they get accelerated across the high voltage, they make collisions with the atoms, and as the electrons leaving the uh, the cathode collide with the atoms in the gas the gas, those electrons in the hydrogen get excited and they go up to higher energy levels and then they de-excite and they give off light. Right. So we'll see if this works. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure the light source works, but see if your glasses work. So the glasses are a type of diffraction grating that should actually separate out the colors of the hydrogen. Um, we talked earlier that there were four wavelengths of hydrogen. There was red, teal, that's greenish blue, I guess you might call it. Um, and there were two blues, actually. There's blue and what we call and violet. With these glasses, you may only see three. Uh, so we'll see how they work. But basically, this is the hydrogen lamp. And if we had the, 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 the diffraction grating here, then I could separate out the wavelengths by different angles, by observing different angles with respect to um, uh, the light hitting the grate. <coughs> so if I plug this in, we'll see what happens. Um, so looking at this first without your glasses, uh, you should see obviously a reddish color. So uh, red is clearly one of the wavelengths that's produced from uh, hydrogen discharge uh, hydrogen discharge and uh, I don't know if you can see from there uh, but you can anyone see lines of spectrum of different colors yes you see but does anybody see the, the the greenish the green one the green line yeah the yellow and green yeah there should be one that's sort of greenish color it's called teal and should be yeah. one that yeah. yes. yeah. 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 After you've looked at it a little bit, and I noticed there's a few people that don't have glasses, so we'll take a minute and you can uh, get, hand them to a friend, to a fellow sitting next to you who doesn't have one, or the lady sitting next to you right here doesn't have any glasses to, to look through. What's special about that light compared to Well, this has only hydrogen. So uh, these, of course, these are now LED lights, so they're solid state. They don't use gas. Most light that we had was basically just a tungsten filament. So when Edison invented light, he was just, he, he was basically looking at, he was using black body radiation. He was heating up a filament until it glowed, right? That's what black body light is. It's a heating up of a, of a solid until it glows light. And, um, uh, so, uh, this is probably more similar to what we call neon lights. <coughs> neon lights are 
lights that have <coughs> colors of wavelengths that are unique to, 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 to neon. And, um, uh, but they're probably not, you know, these type of lights are not real efficient for making, you know, light to see things so we don't use them uh, nearly, ne nearly as much. But you can see the colors, right? Everyone been able to, uh, now somebody want to loan me one of their glasses and I can, since I haven't looked at this yet, I'm going to see what so, I mean, it's a, I don't know if it makes any difference. No, let's see. Now, yeah, and, and you should try it after class. Uh, it definitely looks better when you're up close. Uh, but yeah, I can definitely, yeah, you can see the blue. I can see the purple, too. The blue, the purple, the green, the yellow, and the red. So, uh, they're, all, they're all in there. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So, the whole idea of the, uh, oops, let me turn this off. The, everybody had a view? Are we, there's another side effect of this. They cannot be left on for more than 10 minutes, otherwise they tend to burn out. And then you gotta pay $100 to buy a new hydrogen bulb. But, so, so I'm gonna turn it off. Uh, if you wanna look at it, it actually looks pretty neat if you look up close. I noticed that I was getting a much better view uh, of this uh, when I was close to the light than sitting from where you are. So, uh, we can, you know, you can stay a few minutes after class, you can go and take a look at it. Um, just the way we have the, that flickering, I can't help you with. I don't know. Is that kind of bothering people? I mean, I didn't turn it off until now. Huh? Okay. I mean, I work for, I don't know how our camera, how's our, Camera's gonna be okay. Go to high, high sensitivity setting. Um, so, I mean, the, the whole point of going through this exercise uh, was that uh, there are four there are four wavelengths that we know in the visible that I've written down before, uh, and they are um, 656 nanometers, uh, 486 nanometers. 430, I don't remember the exact number, I think it's 432 nanometers, and 410 or 412 nanometers. So this is the, the red, green, uh, blue, violet, and you saw those lines, those, those colors, when you were looking at it, and all of this, and now we know, because the Bohr theory is still going to give us an idea of the energy levels, that whenever there is a transition, from one energy level to the other, then of the electron, then light is given off. Right? And this light comes off as a photon with uh, energy HC divided by lambda. And we measure this, this photon wavelength and uh, therefore determine, calculate the, the energy. And this energy is, in this case, for example, if this was the n equals 2 and this was the n equals 4 then this would be a transition from uh, the outer E4 energy down to the energy E2. Okay. And uh, these are the electron energy levels, right? These are the electron energy levels. And when they're making a transition, then this is what produces the light. But we've got to be able to calculate these correctly if the theory is going to be good, in other words, they could better agree with these four numbers or our theory is not working. And one of the successes of the Bohr theory is that, yes, it did work very well. The problem is it didn't work for helium and lithium and boron and the other higher uh, elements with once you got into a multi-electron uh, scenario. So um, we needed a different approach, but uh, just to keep you in mind, uh, grounded, grounded in reality, the, the reality is these things are producing this hydrogen bulb is producing light that, that is unique to hydrogen. And so we try to understand as much as we can uh, by studying the energy levels of uh, how well we're doing. And of course, we want to be able to extend this to the multi electron atom as well. Um, okay, so we, we're starting. So this is, this, is the, this is the background. This is where we're starting from. And the scenario is that in predicting these wavelengths that we, we, we have this, this, this kind of 
you know, conceptual picture of the atom, right? Uh, the kind you get in third grade, but it's still useful. Um, okay, so, um, uh, and, and, and of course, obviously, uh, this has some, we will say, this has some uh, radial distance r from the origin, and we did this last time, and of course it has momentum, it has some velocity v, and then if I multiply it by m, I get some momentum p, and of course we talked about angular momentum, and the angular momentum is equal to r cross p, and we were able to, you know, we, do, we could do some calculations based on the Bohr, based on Bohr's assumption that the magnitude of this quantity was equal to some integer times uh, h bar. Uh, we will see that this gets modified, and of course this was, and, and excuse my laziness here, but this is magnitude of L, so I, I just, being a little bit lazy, but n equals one, two, three, etc. Right? Okay, so uh, this thing doesn't work quite as well as we hope. And now um, someone else was thinking about this problem, which was Mr. Schrodinger. And uh, you'll remember that um, when we derive the wave equation for uh, the, that that defined the, the Schrodinger equation, it was defined from the 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 concept of the idea that energy is conserved and we could write that uh, the p squared over 2m times the wave function psi plus the, the u of x times the wave function psi was equal to the total energy e times the wave function psi. And we want to, for bound states, we want to look for what values of e can, what values of E and what functions F, I'm sorry, what functions psi will, will work for this equation. And uh, we went through and showed that this expression involved a, was equivalent to a, the second derivative of psi with respect to x. So we wrote this as minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative with respect to x. Uh, times psi plus u of x times psi is equal to e times psi, also of x, obviously, right? And so this became the differential equation, and we looked at this for the particle in a box, and we looked, well, that's the only one we really solved for, this particle in a box. Um, now we want to apply it and see what happens, how do we get this wave function when now u of x is equal to 1 over 4 pi is equal to the electrostatic potential due, due to a point charge, uh, due, 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 due to a point charge. So this was given by uh, u of x is minus z times e squared times this, this quantity divided by r squared, or divided by r. So, this is, the, this is the potential energy function, right? And now we have to start dealing with things in three dimensions instead of one dimension. Um, and so to deal with that, uh, we write down that uh, if this was one dimensional, this would be p sub x. So it's natural to assume that, um, uh, that the total the kinetic energy is px squared plus py squared plus pz squared. Uh, pz squared, and this is all divided by, by 1 over 2m, right? So that's a new expression, right? But each one of these represents, we showed before, that, um, that uh, uh, minus uh, h bar squared times psi, or times, um, I'm sorry, minus h bar squared, times the second derivative of psi with respect to x, was equal to uh, p squared times psi of x. And this if, if, if psi was equal to e to the i px minus et divided by h bar. Right? And so um, if that was true, then 
we can replace the momentum in the x. We're going to have the second derivative with respect to x for the x component momentum, the second derivative with respect to y for the y component momentum, the second derivative with respect to z for the z component momentum. So if I want to have each of these components in the equation, then I have to have minus h bar squared divided by 2m times the second derivative, and now of course they have to be partial derivatives because psi is not just a function of one variable, now psi is a function of three variables because the electron can be at any coordinate or any, at any of the coordinates x, y, and z with respect to the proton that it's, that it, that it, that it, that it's moving around, right? So x, y, z is the probability of finding it at a given x, y, z will be given by or the probability density will be given by this quantity squared is equal to a probability of finding it at a location p of x, y, z. Right? So unfortunately, the world we live in is three-dimensional, which means that the equations are going to be more complicated, and they're going to be partial derivatives. So um, that means now that, and by partial derivatives, I, I'm assuming you people are familiar with that, that if I have a function of two variables, and I, if I have a partial derivative, if I have phi of, for example, well, in this case, x, y, or z, and if the taking the derivative with respect to x, for example, means I treat this as if I am holding y and z constant. So I treat y and z as constant when I take the derivative uh, of the function with respect to x. So I treat y and z as constants. That's, that's what the partial is. Everybody familiar with that? Everyone had partial derivative before? OK, good, good, all right. So partial squared. Uh, the second derivative of psi with respect to x squared plus the second derivative of psi with respect to y squared to, with respect to y, I'm sorry, but that means squared plus the second derivative of psi with respect to z. Okay. Plus, now I've got to add in the potential term and the potential term is minus z e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught times 1 over r. Okay. Uh, Pasha, is the, is the lighting going to be okay for this? You're, you're really fine. Okay, good. Okay. And this is equal to e times psi. And there's two, there's two things I want to always want to be able to find from the Schrodinger equation. What are the values of e? And what is psi of x, y, and z? Okay. There's two things I have to get out of, out, out of the Schrodinger equation. What are the allowed energies? And what are the, what is the, the wave function that describes the probability of finding it in some vicinity of the atom at some location? And this will be the probability of finding it at x, x y, and z. OK, any, any questions up to this point? Everybody following this OK? Okay, good, good. All right, now, um, well, okay, so it's, it, it, is, it is a complicated problem. Um, so what we first of all have to do, we're not obviously going to solve this problem, but I'm going to point to you so that you at least understand when you see the solutions what they mean. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to change this from uh, Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates. And the reason is that this potential function is given in terms of a radial distance from the origin. It only, the force only depends on the radial distance from the proton. Right? It's a Coulomb attraction between the positive proton and the negative electron. Right? And because this is radial, uh, it turns out uh, that it is much easier, I'm not saying easy, but easier, to solve if we go to polar coordinates. So what we're really going to do is look at psi of r theta and phi. And so in a three-dimensional coordinate system, um, what we would, the way we would draw this is we draw our axes x, uh, y, and z. And the, the object of our concern, one of our objects, is what is psi of r, theta, and phi. So I have to know how to transform the variables from Cartesian coordinates 
to, uh, to polar coordinates. And uh, I think many of you have already seen this before, but uh, if the uh, vector from the origin uh, makes an angle theta with respect to the z-axis, that is, in fact, one of my polar coordinates. The other polar coordinates is the uh, azimuthal angle, phi. So phi would be, for example, the, this would be this angle right here. Um, and then I go up a distance vertically in z to reach my point up here. So my coordinates and spherical coordinates are r, theta, and phi. So there's r is the radial distance to my point of interest, which is where I'm going to calculate psi of r, theta, and phi. And now I need the transformation equations, which are that uh, z can be written as r times the cosine of theta. Um, x is equal to r sine x is equal to r times sine theta cosine of phi, uh, and y is equal to r times sine theta times sine of phi. Okay? I think I'm, I'm assuming you people have seen those before. Right? This is a transformation of equations going from, uh, from Cartesian to, uh, to, 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 to polar coordinates. In so doing this, uh, which is what I will do, uh, these second derivatives all have to be replaced with derivatives with respect to r and theta and phi. Right? Uh, this doesn't have to change because this is already in polar coordinates. Right? U is a function of the radial distance. R is, in fact, <coughs> the distance from the origin, and that is all that, that, that the potential depends on. So the potential is already in polar coordinates. It only depends on r, it doesn't depend on phi, theta and phi. Um, so now what we do is, and we're not going to do the transformation, is that we get an equation with second derivatives that are filled with, uh, with r, theta and phi, uh, and um, um, r, theta and phi, and um, it turns out that in this type of a differential equation, we can write the equations for the solutions in terms of a radial function r, uh, and then I'm going to write sub r because it's a function of the radial distance. And that's the radial wave, the radial part of the wave function. Uh, maybe I'll do this over here so I have more room. So uh, we'll do we'll do psi of r theta and phi is going to be written as r of r times, and then we use this very funny expression for the function of theta, which looks really kind of like a, uh, a large theta with h in the middle, theta of theta, times the capital phi of angle phi. Right? And this is called separation of variables. I have now written a three-dimensional function as the product of a one dimen of three one-dimensional functions. This is the written as the product, this depends only on r, this function depends only on theta, and this function depends only on phi. And for a certain class of differential equations, this is a valid way to solve the differential equation. And it turns out the reason it's convenient is that I can break this, e once I make this, this, the, 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 uh, this uh, uh, equation, I can put this in the Schroeder equation, and I can break it down into a radial equation, a theta equation, and a phi equation. Now I have a differential equation, uh, three differential equations, each of which only depend on one variable. Right? And then I get back to what's called an ordinary differential equation. And those are easier to solve. Right? So that's the path of getting there. Now, um, so the, the, uh, the, the the, the characteristics of these functions, they, they, we have to solve a wave equation. But just as with the particle in a box, the particle in a box has a wave function where it has to vanish at the boundaries, right? That's called a boundary condition. The wave function for an infinite box, the wave function has to go to zero because the probability of being at that value or higher is zero. So the wave function vanishes for the particle in a box, and that's what we had in chapter 41. All right. Well, that was based on a boundary condition. So there are boundary conditions here that we can also apply. For example, whatever this radial function is, remember that when I square this thing, it's going to be a probability, right? 
So if I square r theta and phi, quantity squared, this is a probability function of r theta and phi. Right? This is a probability function. So um, we have to keep that in mind. And then also, what this will tell us is that uh, we know, or we can assume, as a probability function, that the radial function r of r in the limit that r goes to infinity, this thing had better go to zero. Right? Otherwise, this is not a normalized probability function. Right? It has to satisfy the condition that the integral, and this will now be over r theta and phi, the integral of over r equals zero to infinity, we'll do uh, theta of zero to pi, and we'll do phi of zero to two pi. And I'll label these in, in, just, in just a second. Um, so this will be equal to r of r squared times theta squared of theta plus phi squared of phi. Now I need times dv, right? Times dv. This has to be equal to one, right? This is equal to one. This is the integral over r. This is the integral over theta, and this is the integral over phi. Right? Uh, now I need to know what is the element of a volume in in in, in polar coordinates. In, in in Cartesian coordinates, it's it, it, it's it's pretty simple. I can say that the element dv is equal to dx times dy times dz. Right? That's that's a cubic. This is a cubic infinitesimal volume, right? This is a cubic volume, right? Everyone see that? The multiplied element dx. So basically now, I'm taking a little cube around this particular point, and there's my cube, and my cube has a volume element dx, dy, dz, right? And so if I were doing this in Cartesian coordinates, this would be my volume element, and I would multiply this times psi squared, and then I, I would integrate, or basically integrate psi squared over these three variables. Right? And that interval has to equal one, because the probability, this is a probability function, right? This is the probability, this is probability. And the probability that the particle is somewhere in space is equal to one. We assume that the electron is in the atom, otherwise we've got no atom to make light. So there is, there is an electron, right? So, this is the probability function, and this is the way we, we interpret or we write down what the probability function is doing. Um, okay, now, in spherical coordinates, uh, we have a slightly different way of writing this, uh, volume element. And so, um, in spherical coordinates, uh, if I were to look at this, point in space, in spherical coordinates, then, uh, <coughs> then I would take my element dr this way, right? dr would be, would be an element of length in the radial direction. So this is dr. But now I need to have an element of length that goes this way and an element of length that goes um, well, in this case, into the board. So this r vector is sweeping through an angle d, d theta. So there will be an r times this is let me do this way. This this length vector right. This segment right here is r sine theta. R times sine theta. Okay. So um, uh, one element of length is is r sine theta d phi. And another element in the r direction is dr. And now there's an element of length in the, um, uh, in the theta direction. And in the, in the theta direction, it is r times d theta. So if I go this way, by incrementing the angle theta, then I get my third direction of length, which is r times d theta. Okay. So this is my new volume element. My volume element is the product of these three. In, 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 in polar coordinates. So dx, dy, dz now gets replaced with dv, which is going to be equal to um, the product of these three things. And I can combine terms and write them together. And this becomes 
uh, r squared d theta d phi dr. Oh, times sine theta. Right. So this is the, or, or maybe I put the, 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 I should put the derivatives, the differentials on the end. R squared sine theta times d, th d, d, d theta d phi dr. Okay? So everyone say this is an element of volume in polar coordinates. Okay. All right. So this is going to be the the, the 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 volume elements that I'm going to use when I want to calculate the probability function of where to find or how often the electron is located in a given region. And we'll do an example of this in in, in, in just a minute. So in the handout that you have here, the top right side shows you radial functions and. Uh, there are some other features here of the energies and the functions that we have not really gone through quite yet. So we will point out what those, what those features are. Uh, first of all, uh, the solution of the equation, of the, of the Schroeder equation, gives energy levels which are in fact quantized. And the energy levels turn out to be the same as the Bohr theory, minus z e squared uh, divided by, I forgot, what was that? Oh, 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 let's see, minus 13. Uh, I forgot what all the constants are, but I'll try to find them here. Um, what we have from last, from the Bohr theory. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the z squared, uh, e to the, turns out to be e to the fourth, my apology here, e to the fourth, times m divided by 8, epsilon naught squared times h squared times 1 over n squared. Okay, so this is still true, right? It was true for, it was true for the, um, uh, for the Bohr theory of the atom, the energy levels in hydrogen have not changed. And of course, they should not change because they have the correct energy levels to get the observed wavelength. So we know that part was true, anyway. Um, now, we, we also have a simplification of this that we can write. Um, by the way, I'm not sure, but I, I forgot one more factor. This should be z squared, sorry, z squared. Um, what else do we have? Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and in fact, n can be equal to one, two, three, all the way up to infinity. Okay. So that's the one, uh, the, the one feature of the Schrodinger equation that is the same as the Bohr theory of the atom. That uh, that the energies are still defined by by a quantum number n, and this is called the principal quantum number. Okay, this is called the principal quantum number. And, but then something else very interesting comes out of the short equation as well. It turns out that the angular momentum of the particles is also quantized, but not in the way that Bohr thought they were. There was a different rule that came out. And the rule was the following, is that uh, the quantum number of the angular momentum L, which we'll call L squared for magnitude, right? Everyone can follow that, right? The, the square of, the, of a vector is its inner product squared. So this L squared is equal to a product of another quantum number, L, times L plus 1, which we'll define in a minute, times H bar squared. Right? Or magnitude of L is equal to the square root of L times L plus 1 times H bar. Right? And what turns out as a solution to the Schrodinger equation is that L is an integer is, um, is, is, is equal to, it can be equal to zero, it can be equal to one, all the way up to n minus one. Right? So it is limited by the principal quantum number n. So for example, if n is equal to one, 
which is the ground state of the hydrogen atom. So for example, if we call this, for example, n equals 1, uh, then the orbital angular momentum is 0. And now you say, well, if the electron is making an orbit around the, uh, uh, the, 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 the nucleus, the, the proton, how can the angular momentum be 0? And the answer is, because it's not acting like a particle, it's acting like a wave. And the other is, I don't know. The, answer, the, the real answer is, I don't know. The real answer is, we're solving a wave equation and looking at wave properties, even though we're describing particle properties of angular momentum, it turns out that the ground state of hydrogen has zero angular momentum. It's a paradox. I, it, it, it's a similar paradox to, I think we had a particle in a box, which was, you know, if the particle is going back and forth this way, the edges, how come there's points in the middle that it can never, it can never be at? Because it's not acting like a particle, it's acting like a wave. Okay. That may seem like a poor uh, explanation, but it's the closest one we can get. Okay, so um, we'll come back to that later. Then it turns out that there is a third quantum number associated with the solution of Schrodinger equation, which is called the z component of angular momentum. And the z component of angular momentum is quantized by another quantum number of m, which we denote by m sub l, which we will, in order so we, by the way, we don't confuse it with the mass, uh, times h bar. Okay? And there are restrictions on m sub l. m sub l is an integer. First of all, it's an integer, just like n is. So all of these are integers, right? This is an integer. And m sub l is an integer, n is an integer. They're all integers. But m sub l is bounded above by uh, the quantum number l, and it's bounded from below a minus l. So the z component of angular momentum can vary from uh, minus, it can vary, so l sub z can, is, is, you know, is an element of, or belongs to the, the, the region that goes from uh, minus l h bar, uh, all the way up to plus L h bar, but it can only do so in integral steps of h bar. So, for example, if m if L was equal to two, for example, then I could have L z could be if, if if L is equal to two, I can have m sub L equal to minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, or plus two. If m sub l is equal to 3, it can go from minus 3, m sub l can go from minus 3 to plus 3. If m sub l is equal to 4, it can go from minus, m sub, if, l goes from, if l is equal to 4, m sub l can go from minus 4 to plus 4 in these steps. Right? And then, of course, the z component of angular momentum, l sub z, is quantized. So the z component of angular momentum is quantized. Okay? So these are the, uh, the, 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 the concepts or the idea that come out of, uh, of, of, of the Schrodinger equation. Um, so while, while we're on the subject of L and angular momentum, uh, what we can do is to draw a, a vectorial picture of what L would look like. of what L, what are the possible values of the orientation of the, what does the angular momentum vector look like? So, for example, what I can do here is to, let's draw a picture of, again, of my coordinate system. And my coordinate system looks something like this, x. And I'll go back to Cartesian coordinates now because I'm now dealing with the z component of angular momentum. And so if I have, for example, an orbit that's inclined to the, uh, to the, to the axis, the z-axis, then r cross p is going to be a vector that goes up this way. This is the vector L. Right? The vector L is perpendicular to the orbit. You use the right-hand rule, r cross p. Your thumb points in the direction of L. L is perpendicular to the plane of the orbit. L is perpendicular to the plane of the orbit. It's the right-hand rule, and so L then tells us what, what, 
quote, the orbit, right? The orbit, that where, we, where we think, how we think the electron is traveling around, around the proton. Right? Okay, so now what I can do is to indicate, I can use the normal vector to indicate the, or the, the, the inclination of the orbits, right? The L vector tells me uh, whether the orbit is inclined to be parallel to Z, perpendicular to Z, or somewhere in between. So I now know that because Z, L sub Z is quantized, let's draw the vector L. So now what I'm going to do is let's consider again a case where L is equal to 2. So a good case where I have uh, the orbital, this is called the uh, orbital angular momentum quantum number. So this is, yeah, orbital angular momentum quantum number. Um, because it's associated with, 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 with angular momentum. And what I can now do is say, okay, there must be some vector L that has a certain fixed relationship to the z-axis. If this is my vector L, then the z component of L can be as large as, and this is for, Let's, see, let's 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 try to put in the numerical values here. This is equal to the square root of two times two plus one, which is three, times h bar. Right? So this is the this is the magnitude of L. Right? And the highest the z component can be is plus two times h bar. Right? But the orbital angular momentum can also have quantized value in the z direction, which is equal to one times h bar. So there'll be another with the same length vector as the one I had before, but with an inclination with respect to the z axis, which is equal to plus one h bar, or just plus h bar. Then I can also have a z component of angular momentum where there is, uh, which is zero. So in the case of the angular momentum vector, which is zero, then I can have um, the angular momentum vector will be along this way. And in this case, m, m sub l is equal to zero. So lz is equal to zero. Okay? And then I can also have values for the angular momentum, which are in the negative direction. And they can extend to minus two times h bar. And so there'll be one here which goes down to here, which will have a z component of angular momentum, which is equal to minus h bar. And there'll be another one which has a uh, z, the same length vector L, but it now has a uh, z component of angular momentum, which is minus 2 times h bar. Right? So this one has L sub z equal to minus 2 h bar. This one has L sub z equal to minus h bar. This one has L sub z equal to plus h bar. And this one has L sub z equal zero. Okay. So we can think of this as being three quantized orbits with different inclinations with respect to the z-axis. Right. Now, the, one of the problems comes up is that I don't know where the z-axis is. I mean, in my coordinate system sitting right here, uh, the z-axis is straight up, right? And there's my hydrogen gas on the floor. And, but now, the hydrogen molecules are tumbling, right? They're, no, they're, they're not fixed. There could be, in any orientation, they could be tumbling, they could be moving around. There is no z-axis. The, the, there is no xy-axis either. I can, make two, I can make up three perpendicular directions but the electron doesn't have to follow my, my convention on how I define x, y, and z. So what does it mean that the z component is, is fixed? Right. It's a difficult question. Well, the only way I can actually make the z component become a meaningful parameter is to apply a force onto the particle that is in the z, that, 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 or a, a field in the, or in, the, in the direction of that of the particle. So the, typically what we do is, what we do is to do an experiment to actually test this scenario is we apply 
the, uh, the hydrogen gas to an external magnetic field. So we apply a we apply a um, an external magnetic field, and the external magnetic field V is equal to B zero times the vector K, which is in the Z direction. So now, once I turn on the magnetic field, I can now have an axis that is uniquely defined in the lab of what I mean by z. Okay? In other words, I can't really uh, test the meaningfulness of these different orientations of this polarization of the z-axis if I don't know where the z-axis is. And the only way I can know what the z-axis is is to provide an external field or force that defines a preferred direction in space. And the way I do that, and what we will do, is to apply a, 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 to apply a, a field, in this case it will be a magnetic field, in the, in the z direction, and we will now be able to see the effect of the quantization of the angular momentum with respect to that axis. Because now I have a preferred direction in space. Otherwise, see, x, y, and z doesn't mean any difference. You know I, mean? I can't draw a function of x, y, and z if I don't know where x, y, and z are. Okay? So we have to have some reference frame that defines an axis for us. Okay. Now, um, that's, that's one important thing. And these are the three quantum numbers. Okay. So the energies are the same as before. The quantum numbers <coughs> come out. We've got two more that define the components or the angular momentum and the z component. Um, now we can go back and look at the radial function and the solutions to this equation that we want to, want to define. Now, uh, in the handout that I've given you, uh, the theta and phi functions are written together in what are called spherical harmonics. And some of you may have encountered these in other classes. So we will just say r y of theta phi is another way of writing theta of theta times phi of phi. And we'll just combine it as one function, right? With two variables, right? So that's the simplification. So the handout that I've given you now has these, these, these wave functions on them. And you can see them from. Um, the handout. So um, the radial function. So first of all, uh, there's some more conditions that, that, that get applied in, uh, in, in these solutions. The ones that we'll probably be most interested in are the radial wave functions, because that's the easiest to conceptualize, which is, what's the probability of finding the electron at one nanometer from the center of the atom? from half a nanometer from the center of the atom, or from a quarter million. What is the radial probability distribution? Right? That's what we're looking at in terms of quantum. From a classical point of view, in the Bohr theory, R is a constant and there's different values of R at different energy. The particle can only have one unique value of R in the Bohr theory. In the Schrodinger theory, the, uh, the particle can be at any value of R, but the probability of it being at a very large distance from the origin, better go to zero. Otherwise, this integral of that function over all space is not going to equal one. If r is, goes to any finite number other than zero, then this integral is no longer finite, because it goes from zero to infinity. Right? So uh, r has to go to zero as r goes to infinity. That's, that's one, one, one condition. So one of the things that comes out of this is that um, uh, the, 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 these wave functions are that I can also write that um, uh, that they are they they obey huh, another bad pen. Say this one. Yeah, that's better. Okay. That uh, they are characterized by the quantum numbers n and l, which is the orbital, the principal quantum number, and the angular momentum quantum number, l, uh, times y l of m and m of theta and phi. So these are now what we call the wave function psi of r, theta, and phi, which we get by multiplying them together. 
Okay? Of course, we can look at either one separately and see what's it's get a picture of of what what is going on when we look at the individual wave functions. But of course, we're only interested in the square, right? Squared, squared, squared. This is equal to probability of r theta phi, right? That's our probability function, right? If I integrate that, then I, I, I'm subject to this condition. All right. So what are the radial wave functions? Well, the radial wave functions, uh, first of all, notice that right here, that because of the fact that L has to be less than or equal to n minus 1, and M has to be less than or equal to L, that I can only pair certain combinations of the radial wave function of NL with certain combinations of LM if they satisfy this condition. Right? So I can't have, for example, uh, a principal quantum number n equals 2 with an angular momentum wave function of L equals 6. It's too big. It can't, cannot, cannot possibly exist. So um, that's the, um, the basic idea of what, we, uh, of, 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 of what we're dealing with. So if I look at the first one, let's look at the first wave function. Uh, the first wave function is for n equals 1 and l equals 0. All right? And so if we look at the handout, we can see that the radial wave function of r10 of r is equal to 4. And I'm going to, oh, let's square it, right? We want to square this because we're only interested in probabilities, right? So the probability is going to be given by the square of the wave function. So the radial probability distribution is going to be equal to 4 times z over uh, a0. And by the way, a0 is the Bohr orbit, which we'll define here in just a second. A minus e to the negative 2 z r over A0. And A0 is the first Bohr orbit, is the first Bohr radius. So first Bohr radius for n equals 1 in the Bohr theory. Right? So remember in the Bohr theory, the radii were, were quantized. <coughs> the radii, the radii, the radii were quantized, and so we're going to evaluate it for n equals one. And when we do that, that's equal to we calculate that that's 0.053 nanometers. Okay. So A0 sets the scale. It says it's going to tell us exactly how far we can find an electron from the center of the atom, but the probability function has to follow this this particular. Uh, this particular form. Okay, so if I plot that, if you turn your page over to the other side, then um, uh, uh, yeah, okay, we, we, we forgot, we left something out here. Okay, let's let's go back a second. Okay, so uh, if I'm doing with a, let's suppose that I want to find the uh, the probability that the, that the particle, the electron, lies between uh, a two radii, which is an interval of dr, then um, the volume element between uh, in, in these two shells is going to be equal to the volume element dv is going to be equal to four pi times r squared times dr. <coughs> so in other words, if I take 4 pi r squared, which is the area of a, of a sphere, and I multiply it by dr, I get the volume of this shell that goes all the way around. Right? If I have the volume of this shell, then this is my element d, dv, then I want to multiply that times this probability function. So the probability um, function, the probability uh, is going to be equal to uh, 4 pi is going to be equal to 16 pi 
times uh, z over a0, where a0 is 0.053, the radius of the first Bohr orbit, three times c cubed, times r squared, times e to the minus 2z r over r over r sub a. Okay. And this will be times dr. So, let's integrate this. Integrate this between two limits. Let's say from r1 to r2. This will be the probability of finding the particle between two radii r1 and r2. And this will give us this, this will this this will this will give us the probability. So the probability function right here is r squared times e to the minus 2zr over a0. This is the probability function. And if I plot the probability function, then I get the figure on uh, the lower left side of your handout on the second page as a peak value of like this. And the peak value of the radius is at, uh, is at the first Bohr orbit. So this is the probability distribution versus the distance from, this is distance from the proton. Right? This is distance from the proton. And the most likely distance to find the, the proton, the most likely position to find the electron is at a distance A0, which is equal to 0 0.053 nanometers. This is the most probable distance to find the electron in the ground state of a hydrogen atom. It is still possible to find it anywhere else. It may also be out at 20 times that distance, but with a much lower probability. Or it could be very close to the origin, but at a much lower probability. So the most likely place to find it is exactly where, where Bohr predicted that it would be. It's at the first Bohr orbit radius. Okay. So next time we'll, we'll carry on a little bit more of these. I have not posted for chapter 42 homework yet, yet, but I will do so shortly. And uh, please continue reading chapter 42.